Okay, so uh, thank you for that, to, uh, Louise. It was a lot of fun and to see the progress that's being made. Um, just with my uh, history hat on, you know, the uh, RFT and ACT kind of co-evolved, and, and RFT is a much bigger enterprise. It's not linked to ACT per se, but it kind of should be in this way because if, if we figure out things in terms of the underlying processes that account for human language and cognition, we'd want to move them into clinical applications. So if, if I have anything to do with it, as things move, we'll keep put, putting them into whatever ACT is. It doesn't really matter of name, whatever you call that, just so that uh, you know it's, we don't think of it like a protocol or technique, but some sort of linkage to uh, uh, processes and principles. But uh, although they co-evolved, for a long time, you know, the, the links were more metaphorical than they were empirical. Um, there were some guesses in the earliest work that now uh, are coming along, like that 84 paper on making sense of spirituality that essentially had didactic frames in there, had something on sense of self, and uh, linking it all to act. And, and now we actually have data, so it's kind of f fun to, uh, to see this evolve. But uh, I'm going to... Uh, not ask the first question. I think I'll, I'll turn it over to the class, and I would ask um, the class members as you, uh, even even if uh, you know Louise, Louise knows you. Just for this, since we're recording this for uh, posterity, to go ahead and uh, say who you are, and uh, we'll uh, take a range of questions, Louise, and uh, probably take about an hour here. Uh, uh, but uh, others in the class, if you have follow-up comments or questions, uh, you can, to some degree, jump in. I don't think we'll, we may not be able to reach all the members of the class with a question, so just to put a framework on it. Is there anything that uh, you wanted to add, uh, Louise, just before we get into some questions, or no. are we good to go? Okay, okay who wants to uh, take the first question, and I'll pass the mic to you. Anybody have a place to start? I got it. Do I need to move or you, you got the camera? Hi, Luis. I'm uh, Donnie Newsom. Hi. Uh, ni nice to see you. Um, which end of this do I speak into? Uh, the top end. The blinky end? Okay. Um, so, so sort of on this note that uh, that that Steve has brought up about how we can move things over from uh, uh, what we're learning in the basic research kind of into ACT application. W one of the things that um, I, I found uh, really surprising to read in the, in the so thought suppression paper was about how the, uh, the generalization of, of thought suppression uh, can come under contextual control. Um, and so it, it makes me wonder, does that inform something different about the way we, we look at thought suppression? In other words, is there actually some hope for thought suppression as being a, a successful strategy if it's coached and sort of shaped up in, in the right way such that uh, we don't get the overgeneralization that makes thought suppression so problematic? Um, and I, I don't know, maybe this is as much a question for Steve as, as uh, for you, Luis, but I'd love to see what you guys can come up with on that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I don't think. Um, yeah. Right. It wasn't so much that um, I, I thought that there was different contexts in which suppression would occur and not occur, as as so much just trying to control for um, the fact that it might be that participants were just removing everything that had been related to bear in a um, a, a phase just prior to that. Um, I think in terms of the thought suppression literature, and we, and in terms of Nick has conducted uh, 22 studies in the last few years with it, and um, we've never been able to put together a paradigm where any of the participants didn't report um, an occurrence of the unwanted target thought, which implies that um, thought suppression isn't successful. Um, a couple of things. Um, I think in the retrieval and use forgetting literature, Anderson and Green in 2000 um, did actually, and it was sort of a bit revolutionary, they sort of said that they did actually model uh, successful thought suppression. Um, and they'd used a paradigm where they got participants to pair um, 
dichotomies of stimuli together, so orange and spider. Um, and then they were asked when the red light appeared on the screen to um, respond to the second of the pair in the dichotomy and when maybe green was on the screen or vice versa to not um, respond at all to the other item. And they did find that in some subsequent task that participants then didn't retrieve as they were looking at it um, the items that they've been the items that they hadn't been responding to during the task. I think that was the only paper um, in recent times that I've seen where they've sort of reported successful suppression and that task is so different and so unusual. Um, so uh, to speak to that, um, Nick and I were thinking maybe it was that there was just so many distractors. Um, maybe it's the number of distractors that we have that could maybe promote successful suppression versus just focusing on one distractor. Um, so we compared that in, the, in an experimental task and actually um, multiple distractors creates more occurrences of the thought suppression, which actually in retrospect makes a lot of sense from an RFT perspective because um, you're providing yourself with multiple cues or that could remind you um, of the stimulus item and the way language is, is so relational, you can relate so many different things in different ways that the different distractors were serving to remind the participants more of the um, target stimulus, even though they weren't related to it at all, if you like, um, than the just having one focus distractor. But even in the focus distraction, when they were just focusing on one thing, it was like a red Volkswagen, um, they still were reporting occurrences of the unwanted thought. So we can't get, we can't get participants to successfully suppress in the lab anyway. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. That was a great answer. I appreciate it. Hi, my name is Michaela. It's good to see you, Hi. Louise. Hey, too. <laughs> um, I have another question in regard to the thought suppression work that you've done. Um, in the study that you went over that you did with Nick, um, you trained words to equivalence and then looked at the derived relations. Um, I'm curious about what, what you would hypothesize if you had trained words in opposition. Um, what yeah. would you expect um, in yeah. terms of the transformation of stimulus functions? So that's a, a fun question and I know a little bit about this because I actually got a student to bring the data to me yesterday <laughs> and we looked at this, we did this, this is good, but we didn't quite do it right. So, um, well, what I would have predicted before looking at the data is um, that I assumed we would definitely replicate the, the um, effect that in the Hooper study that items that had been trained as same as bear would be removed. Um, and then in terms of items that were trained as opposite to bear, um, well, I wasn't sure whether they would be removed also because they also serve to remind, like black reminds you of white, even though they're in opposition. Um, so she just had data from 10 participants, but actually um, the way it worked out was all bar one were replicating the same effect, they were removing the same as words, and four out of the 10 were removing the opposite item as well, but not six of them weren't. So at the moment, um, it looks like uh, some participants will even remove uh, the items that are opposite to the, the target item um, but so far. But we've, we've to collect more data because we hadn't, uh, for these participants, we hadn't put in the, um, non, the arbitrary test for same and opposite. So we, we literally just trained them to a criterion and didn't test them. Um, until afterwards and uh, yeah. So we're gonna test them before we actually do the procedure now to see is after the test we get more of the derived performance to the opposite stimuli. So it's a work in progress, I think. Great, thank you. I think it's especially um, for me relevant in my clinical work because I think a lot of times clients will also will try to distract by thinking of the opposite. And so I yeah. wondered then if actually the opposite word would then exhibit um, the derived relation of the word they're trying to distract from, like psychologically be present in that way. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, because I think it is uh, one of the ones that 
kind of clinical implications of it. You might think that this would evolve over time, um, uh, you know, and, and it might it be particularly uh, sensitive to how important it is to suppress. Like, um, if you are uh, not struggling a lot with anxiety and you think I'm relaxed, uh, it might not really evoke much suppression linked to don't be nervous. But by the time you get into a, a clinical situation where you have a history of that and you have where it's also a very strong aversive that you're trying to avoid, it would be interesting to kind of look at that, so sort of model the the time and um, uh, amount parameters that might lead to this kind of unwanted spread, even through opposite would be a good one just because it's uh, so common that people go there clinically where they try to pick things like in distractors, I'll, I'll, I'll do my you know, positive imagery, let's say. Um, there's a little bit of recent data that people who are uh, uh, high in uh, neuroticism, for example, if you try to, if you use um, cognitive reappraisal uh, that just pushes towards uh, more positive and rational ways of thinking, that it actually uh, uh, can be harmful, not even just inert, but harmful. But if you're not very high in neuroticism and so forth, it might be modeling some some of the same thing, that with enough time and intensity, what would uh, otherwise not necessarily evoke the uh, uh, suppressed item will actually evoke it. Uh, so exactly when you need thought suppression to work and you start thinking of positive things and so forth because you're afraid of the negative ones, it will be when it fails you. Because the more important it is and the more you're, you, you kind of need to rely on it, the less reliable. Uh, that'd be a really cool thing to model. Um, yeah. It might even actually, be, if you had those four versus the six, you might even be set picking up on something. You might actually, I, I would guess, for example, in terms of uh, uh, clinical issues, AAQs, uh, uh, neuroticism, <laughs> so you probably actually got a little assessment device here. Yeah, well, we have got their AAQ scores and stuff, but obviously I haven't looked at that. But there could be, you know, because we take, we do typically screen, you know, AAQ, WBSI, so we might be able to see something. I'm thinking, in another study, um, we used, you know, spider of fearful um, participants with um, the, the behavioral approach test, you know, where they have to actually approach the spider and touch it. Yeah. But we didn't do that with sort of, we didn't get, the, we didn't train up a derived uh, relation in that study. We just literally put them into a thought suppression, 10 minute induction and mindfulness for 10 minutes. And when we did the mindful um, or the focused attention induction for 10 minutes, they were going significantly closer to the spider than the thought suppression which implies the valence of the stimulus, obviously. Um, yeah, but I suppose we didn't have a neutral control where the stimulus was neutral. So, yeah, I think we could potentially use some kind of subclinical group with derived um, same opposite. And I'm, I'm guessing, yeah, likely if, if you know you really don't want to think about spiders, the, the opposite relation to that would start to become very important to not right. have either. Right. Yeah. That's great. Other... Uh... Who's next? Who wants to go? Matthew? Hi, Louise. Hi. So, I'm Matthew Villat, PhD, uh, postdoc uh, here. Uh, so I have a question for you, Louise. Uh, I know you're not a clinician, but I'm pretty sure you will have uh, something to say about that. So you, you explain us that uh, ACT is based on RFT. Uh, however, a lot of ACT techniques are designed outside laboratories which is uh, actually uh, commonly the case for uh, CBT in, in general. Um, do you think old ACT techniques must be uh, eventually supported by an RFT analysis and uh, an, an experimental study? And more precisely, uh, how can RFT help uh, in designing uh, ACT techniques? And if you could give us an example, that would be very interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. New techniques. Um, I think ultimately, um, well, I'm a scientist, so uh, I think for the, the treatment package to be ultimately effective for its ongoing development and evolution, I think it is important that um, 
the different processes that are being used are modelled in terms of derived stimulus relations or behaviour analysis. I think some of the committed actions part um, probably links into just behaviour analysis and doesn't even have to look at derived stimulus relations. Um, I think it's important that uh, therapists understand uh, relational frame theory to some degree because of the fact that if we're going to be, we should be speaking in the same terms and looking in the same, at the same terminology and understanding the, the sort of functional units of behaviour that we're trying to um, change in the same way. Um, and I think if, if a therapist is, is putting a, an act exercise into practice and if they don't know what the underlying RFT um, account of that is or, or why it works, then if it starts to go wrong, with the client, it's harder for them in vivo even to mediate or sorry, modify what they're doing to, to try and tighten up what's occurring. Um, and in terms of examples, I think um, when Brian was Brian Roach's study with Melia, um, there was trying to model sort of exactly what's involved in um, cognitive diffusion and sort of different ways in which we might be able to break down sort of the verbal coherence. Um, I think some of the literature on metaphor with dry stimulus relations um, can speak to the efficacy of different types of presentations of metaphors. I think Yvonne um, has done sort of a video piece on that as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> So follow up on that, and I actually I agree with that answer. That's exactly right. Although if you kind of look ahead over over time, it it will be quite a challenge because clinicians have a hard hard enough time getting on top of some of these uh, um, kind of contextual behavioral ways of thinking that are inside the act work, and to actually then get on top of RFT. Oh my goodness! Uh, although I have noticed that clinicians, as they get involved in the act work, the, the better ones do even if they come to it from very different traditions, do begin to become interested in the, in the behavioral processes in RFT, so maybe it's not going to be as big a barrier as I fear. But coming back to, there's a, a different aspect of, of this issue that I wonder if you have thoughts about. Many of the processes that are pathological that we're trying to look at in an act perspective have to do with excesses of human language and cognition, or failures to bring them under control, <laughs> or failures to understand certain kinds of, uh, or develop certain kinds of skills uh, that are possible uh, and are afforded by an, an analysis of human language and cognition but aren't normally established in the social verbal community. Yet when we're dealing, let's say, with disabled children or things of that kind, you know, we're involved in language acquisition <laughs> we're trying to establish the very verbal functions which later on are going to make them miserable. <laughs> we've, a, we've actually seen this in some early data with things like, for example, you establish sense of self with a, a child who doesn't really have it very well, and suddenly you start seeing conduct disordered problems, and then you look at why they suddenly, <laughs> they suddenly realize that they're being teased by other children, and before that they didn't understand that. like. The child goes home and says to his mother, you know, what does tarred mean? You know, and it's just so painful to watch in a way because you're, you're dragging them into another level of being and then they're going to have problems there. I want, uh, do you have thoughts about uh, how we might use RFT to develop language skills that are needed in problem solving, sense of self and all that in children, but to do it in a way that might prevent some of the problems that we then see later when these language functions sort of take on a life of their own and go uh, to places where they shouldn't go or fail to come into contextual control. Do you have any thoughts about that? Because I know you've done and you've seen some of this uh, you know, early um, uh, childhood work and so forth. Any thoughts? Um. Well, I mean, when I was putting together the talk, it was dawning on me that uh, even though I thought I was um, modeling a lot of the link between RFT and ACT, a lot of the work is actually looking at the, the bad effects of language uh, outside of the sort of perspective taking stuff, which is actually you know, an area that can be deficited and can actually improve. Um, I, 
imagine that we'd have to hand in hand um, be while training up proficient repertoires in different types of, of relational framing and perspective taking, etc. Some of the techniques that are used in in ACT in terms of a milder version or a kid's version of um, building in diffusion or surface context into an educational setting as well could help to um, downplay some of the negative effects of language. Do you want something more specific? No, I, I, I just, I, I don't know that we've done much work on it as a community, but you can see it coming. I mean, these two yeah. sides, the RFT work as it gets into application and establishing verbal yeah. functions, the ACT side, which is already sort of trying to deal with excesses of those functions, we're going to have to find a way to put all that together, too. And I don't know if that will go under the umbrella of ACT, probably not, but it, it, it's under the umbrella of CBS, and it's it's something that we need to, to figure out as uh, modern behavior analysts, I think. Yeah. Let's put it over to Tom. Hey, Louise. I'm Tom Sabo. I'm a doctoral student in the Behavior Analysis Program. Hi, how are you? Hey. Uh, you know, I, I was just listening to what Steve's question uh, uh, intimated uh, in with respect to uh, building appropriate repertoires, and I think that's actually what Donnie was asking with respect to thought suppression. Can we develop some discrimination uh, tools within RFT in order to, to refine and the, the, the repertoire that come across the, the language so that people don't run into those kinds of problems that they do, uh, the, the suffering that, that languaging kind of produces. So I want to kind of go, go with that theme a little bit further, but in a different direction, if that's OK. Because uh, I, I was kind of thinking about some applications of how we could uh, use the stuff that you're developing in, with the active framing in, in some other contexts that we haven't seen them used before. And I was thinking about. Um, you mentioned when you're discussing in, in the in the framing article about uh, training now then relations that temporal relations are unique because you can't uh, you can't teach them compounded with with I and U at the same time. Well, what if you were to actually do that in one particular situation? What if you're what if you're training detectives to be much quicker and much more adept at are uh, piecing together people's stories and figuring out where there's where there's uh, where there's disparate elements that don't belong. Could you actually do some didactic framing uh, training to build up those repertoires inside of, of law enforcement professionals so that they could catch those kinds of things more quickly? Okay. Um, Roger Vildeberga has done some work with um, adults in terms of looking at their uh, empathizing and reducing levels of stigmatizing by uh, giving them uh, exposure to these types of deactic relational frames. Um, and in terms of just, just prior to um, investigating a crime, if, if you were to sort of engage in those types of flexible repertoires, I assume that like any cr criminal detective will have proficient repertoires in perspective taking, but even in the local level, getting um, yourself into the, the for shifting those dialectics before you take on a, another case could potentially um, orient you towards the, uh, taking the inside of the the criminal. Yeah, think about what it would be like to be working undercover and to be able to have this flexible repertoire and be able to like bounce back and forth between my perspective if I was you and not me and and back and forth. You know what I mean? Could be very helpful. And think about the the, the the stress and the burnout of, of <laughs> law enforcement people who work on the edge and kind of slip over the edge and and uh, and you know they're they're playing a role and then they can't really see themselves any further. Yeah, I I I wonder if you could build up even more and more complex control over a deck, deck relation or responding. Um, yeah, maybe that would make some kind of some kind of distinction. It's just that adults will have a lot of those types of repertoires to some degree already, you know. And I imagine in their job that they should be engaging in some of those repertoires. But um, yeah, so it would be interesting to see. Hello, Louise. Hi. Um, 
I'm Greg, and uh, um, I'm, I want to go back to kind of what Steve was talking about, about um, how can we prevent um, language excesses. And I was thinking about like the modeling that parents can provide for their children and things like that. And um, in some of the work that you had done on parental stress, uh, relating to parents who have um, children with with autism, I was wondering how uh, increasing their psychological flexibility of the caregivers uh, would improve the behavioral performance of their kids um, in terms of the um, uh, the children with autism, and perhaps maybe if even if that would apply to caregivers in general uh, who are pretty uh, stressed out, um, how that may uh, in, improve the behavioral uh, competence of, of the people that they're caring for. Uh, let's say uh, people in the sandwich generation who are also taking care of their uh, <laughs> parents with dementia, let's say. Oh, well, wow. I've never heard of the sandwich thing. Okay. Um, I think JT Blackledge has done a lot of work with um, parents of children with autism and um, workshops on acceptance and commitment therapy um, to good outcomes. Um, in terms of whether he measured reduction of stress, I'm not sure, but certainly sort of their quality, quality of life and valued living was increased by these types of workshops, which one would imagine is linking to stress um, and then I think if, if you can get a reduction in, in reduction in stress obviously then a lot of the child behavior problems might um, be managed more efficiently because you're like more likely to be consistent you're more likely to give more time to some kind of behavior program etc but it does look like um, acceptance and commitment therapy um, even group workshops are really effective in helping parent parents reduce stress um, and particularly parents with children with autism. Yeah. I just want to follow up on what uh, uh, Greg was uh, asking. Um, because it has to do with this modeling of some of these um, skills. And let's go back to the issue of perspective taking, for example. Um, I'll take it in a slightly different direction, but I'll come back. Um, the uh, perspective taking isn't all to the good. Uh, you can easily imagine people who are very skilled at perspective taking who are dangerous to be around. Uh, you know the uh, the psychopath who kind of knows what motivates you. Um, just go hang around the local bar and watch people hit on each other, and you'll see it. I mean, people will lie and whatever just in order to get whatever they're trying to get out of these social interactions, using people around them. And uh, uh, frankly, women are probably subjected that to that more than um, uh, men. But uh, uh, this is not necessarily a good skill of. Uh, yeah. Being able to take the perspective of another if it's not harnessed to other things. And um, it goes in a different direction from what you're talking about, I guess, to fully open. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But coming back then, if we come back to Greg's point of here you've got children, let's say, who have uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, deficits that you're trying to, to, to uh, establish, it raises the same kind of issue of. of is there a way, or do we have any ideas about how we can get these language functions uh, put more into the community in a way that can lead to pro-social behavior on the, and, and healthy behavior on the part of parents and teachers and uh, you know school and university administrators and people in bars and, and the rest? How can we build? You know, now I've got a question that's too broad even to answer, but. Uh, looking at the costs and benefits of these different kinds of verbal skills that we're interested in, do you have any thoughts about uh, 
how we can build a kind of a social verbal community that uh, can harness them in, in a way that's pro-social and positive su and supportive of people in these different roles. Um, I, I see it all the time in my parental role and I see it just looking around me that uh, each of these processes that we're talking about when you go all the way down to an RFT point of view, these aren't things you can sort into positive or negative. These are just skills and you can easily use them in ways that are harmful to yourself and others. So I'm yeah. pushing a little harder on what he was asking about because we do know that you know, like the act stuff can be helpful and stuff, but what would the RFT side of it say about how to um, set up these kinds of uh, social interactions in a way that are um, positive for all the players? Yeah, um, in the developmental literature, and this was something I was um, just giving some thought to, um, bullies are really, really good perspective takers. So kids that are bullies are really good perspective takers. And, you know, thinking about that, you know, you expect that you're going to increase empathy in people who are really good perspective takers. So that's a bit, of course they are probably because of what they're trying to do. Um, and I was thinking, it seems like the the emotional functions are not transferring for this group across the diectics. Um, and so, so they're still getting these relational repertoires and they're able to use them to their advantage, but somehow no empathy is coming across in this. Um, and, you know, I wondered if, if, if targeting um, training dialectic relational protocols that actually plug the emotions actually into them might start to get at this and we might are directly targeting that transfer of emotive functions might be some way to um, bridge that gap between sort of perspective taking and yet bullying, <laughs> where you would have thought these people would have been using these repertoires to their advantage. Um, so this was something that I have been thinking um, needed to be done, really. Uh, yeah, that's neat. We, there's some data uh, here, and I think Matthew's had some connection with it, Roger Villarraga here in my lab, and some folks in Spain saying, showing that the transformation part, the empathy part, ha has to be there, perspective taking has to be there, but then experiential avoidance has to be dealt with, because if you get the <laughs> first two, but not the last one, well, then you look around you and you see all this suffering and pain and stuff that overwhelms you. <laughs> so you probably need all three of them working together in order to, to get good pro-social yeah. behavior. Um, and there's some evidence on that in social anhedonia and some areas like that that those three are all involved. Well, other um, who's, who wants to go? Hi, Elise. Hi, My name's Emily. Um, and I'm in the behavior analysis program. Um, and I have a question about perspective taking. And um, um, in the last part of your chapter on that perspective taking, you were talking about how you did a study with kids with high-functioning autism um, and Asperger's and that you didn't find a deficit in their ability to kind of form some of those reversal type relations or engage in those reversal and double reversals. Um, and I was wondering if you had applied that to populations of kids with learning disabilities or information processing disorders in that they don't typically show social delays, but they do show language acquisition delays. And I was wondering if you had seen kind of some issues with trying to figure out those double reversals and other reversals. Okay. Um, well, so there's two um, different studies I'm sort of thinking of. One, that was that was Ruthann Rehfeld who conducted that, that study. Um, one is that uh, a student has done a multiple probe de design with autism to train up all of those repertoires where they were deficient beforehand um, and has gotten some generalization to um, sort of cartoon-based situations where they're, they're, you're asking them, you know, what the emotion is. Um, but separately to that, um, another student is looking at a comparison of training perspective taking in Down syndrome and autism, um, but she's just collecting data at the moment. And apart from that, um, I don't know of any other studies that are doing that at the moment. Is that answering your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, Louise. My name is Greg Smith, um, and I'm in the yeah. behavior analysis program here. Yeah. Um, and my my question is uh, kind of going back more towards the 
the kind of RFT stuff. And I, I think what I'm going to do is just kind of ask you, if you don't mind, to kind of think out loud and kind of just speculate on some things um, with respect to <laughs> your question. Um, <clears throat> sort of trying to take some of the RFT uh, kind of processes and see how they might feed back into the applied setting and so, and so act interventions kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> One thing that, that I find interesting, and this touches on the thought suppression that uh, was discussed in a previous question, um, where uh, even something that is uh, in a relation of opposition can still um, evoke, you know, as you said, white evoke black or et cetera, um, given their, their opposites. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the sort of uh, general relations have very kind of finite um, with, within the sort of aspects of a relational frame, the mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment, they're sort of very kind of finite um, relations there. But what I thought was interesting was some of them, for example, um, within a uh, frame of difference, the combinatorial entailment, you know, if this stimulus is different from this stimulus, and this stimulus is different from this stimulus, and that's directly trained, the combinatorial entailment aspect of it is sort of, you know, what is the relation, you know, let's say A is different than B, B is different than C, what's the relation of A to C? And really the answer is sort of, you know. Unspecified. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that, you know, um, exactly how are they related? Um, and so I, I guess kind of where I'm going with that is, do you think there's any room for those kind of less finite and more sort of open and loose kind of uh, relations to get in there and, and, and have any impact on uh, the sort of kind of tight, rigid um, kind of rule following and, and literalization um, that results from our sort of standard kind of uh, repertoires of verbal behavior and obviously one of the one of the things you want to try to do with ACT, obviously, is, you know, is get in there and kind of loosen that up and kind of deliteralize things and kind of get more uh, flexible sort of responding um, within various, you know, contexts. So is there, uh, that's, uh, that might, you know, be sort of a really abstract question, but do you think there's any, any application for some of that kind of loose, loose stuff? There? Um, so sort of going back to the type of work that um, in, in, in terms of rule following, and, and, and rigid behavior patterns with that, going back to this type of thing that I suppose Steve did with Brownstein and Steele in the um, 80s or 90s, early 90s. Um, uh, we have, I'm following on from what you said with rigid rule following maybe. Um, we've been starting to try to replicate some of those um, earlier experiments with participants and, and we're screening them for on OCD measures to see um, if they're more inclined to follow pliantly um, uh, self-generated rule, if you like, um, inappropriately when the contingencies are no longer in place. And we are seeing with um, participants that are um, scoring very highly on these OCD measures that they do seem to become very schedule insensitive um, beyond when it's good from their own self-generated um, self rules. Um, I suppose at the level of um, looser relations, um, how would that fit in? I'm not totally sure how I would fit that in there. Steve, do you want to? Uh, we have a little bit of uh, work in the lab. Jennifer Quinones has a piece that's kind of shopping for a home where you take these ambiguous relational networks and then you uh, give them uh, uh, pre-training to try to get them to put things together, like because they're both different, they're the same, okay. versus if they're different, then we really don't know the difference. <laughs> and, um, there was that old uh, work some years ago about uh, uh, measures of rigidity and so forth, predicting some of these rigidity of, of rule governance in, in the, uh, the preparations that were being used back then in the. 80s and stuff, and I, I do think it's possible that you could get these kind of different cognitive styles. What we had found is that if, if you do some pre-training about uh, putting together this uh, ambiguous relations one way versus the other, it then played out over a number of different kinds of ambiguous relations within the training session. Um, maybe some of these things that we think of as like personality are kind of like that. Like some people might... Um, you know, any enemy of my uh, enemy is my friend. <laughs> to sort of do that and put things together in that way. Or paranoid folks, you know, where things are that are unrelated are constantly being pulled together into a network. 
Um, I think OCD might be another one uh, uh, where it's actually not, it's an ambiguous relation, but you can disambiguate in different ways. And there is something uncomfortable about, I don't know what the relation is. You know, like when, when you do when you do that, uh, you know, A is different than B and A, uh, you know, et cetera, and then you get to the unspecified relation, there's something uncomfortable about that. And uh, if you're not willing to sort of sit with that discomfort, you can you can uh, disambiguate it in ways that then might have a, uh, you know, a, a generalized effect when you get to things like rules. You'd be, you take that same process and put into just the normal reasoning about your world and you're going to be systematizing things that don't really need to be systematized, for example. And I do think diffusion and things like that are, uh, and acceptance is sort of training in, you know, in a way of sort of sitting with ambiguity. Yeah. Uh, in fact, contextualism itself is kind of ambiguous in a way, doesn't it? You don't, you don't make an ontological claims. I mean, it, it has some of that same quality. Anyway, um, just a comment. But if you have any comments based on that, I'd love to hear. Um, um, I, I think that's really interesting. That study that um, what was her name? Jennifer Quinones. Oh yeah, that's cool. That well, that's what she's doing there is really really interesting. Um, and she's just getting that with participants that have no pr prior clinical history or... Yeah, when we did this in a, the, the first study, we got kind of like your you know, four out of ten uh, situation yeah, yeah. With, uh, <laughs> yeah. with your opposites. Some people went one way, some people went the other way. Uh, but there was a consistency we found in, if you did that in one network, then it, we could predict what you would do with other networks. So it was, like, it was kind of almost like a trait measure. But then the reason we did the second study where we showed we could bias it by the pre-training so we don't just leave it as kind of a, uh, a, you know, a personality variable or something. It, it's a historical variable, but it's one that has broad implications because there's lots and lots of relational networks or aspects of relational networks that are ambiguous. And what you're going to do with those has a big impact on how you're going to problem solve and reason, you know, generate rules, etc. Anyway. So if you look for verbal coherence, do you think for t diffusion is even harder to establish with somebody who really seeks verbal coherence at a very, very strong, I know we all do to some extent, but with that type of group, diffusion must be more difficult then. If you were saying a group of, yeah, yeah, which makes you know, sense. You, you see the same kind of thing in self as context, you know, because there's something kind of satisfying about buying into the story of who you are and what you're like. Uh, and when, when you, you know, even though you have to exclude all kinds of information in order to do it, because it's too small a part of a total human life, whatever story you tell, um, and diffusion much the same way, and, and with clients who are more rigid, like for example, we have in our OCD trials, where we have a recent randomized trial and stuff where we've actually been looking with a number of these patients, um, I'd say the two ones where it comes up are acceptance, are, are diffusion and self as context. Both of those are uh, disorienting because it's kind of like if I'm not who I say I am, who am I? <laughs> and if this isn't what I say it is, what is it? <laughs> and, you know, the whole style cognitively for some of these uh, clinical things working at OCD uh, and personality disorders of various kinds and so forth is this kind of, uh, there's a kind of brittleness or rigidity. It's systematized, put together. I think you see some of the same thing in certain kinds of psychotic processes. In, in paranoia, for example. Systematized, put together, tight. It all hangs together. And coherence seems to be the big reinforcer. Being right about it, and knowing the right answer. Uh, any comments? And then I'll pass it on. Yeah, no, that's really stuff. Hi, Louise. Hi. I'm Jessica. I'm a clinical student here at NAR. Um, I actually was kind of a little bit off topic considering what we have been talking about, but I'm interested in um, some of these studies that I've heard about um, and, and read a little bit about. And I think you actually mentioned it in passing in the perspective taking paper that we read. 
Um, it was about the, the, this kind of um, some possible evidence that chimpanzees and some other nonverbal animals might have theory of mind. I think you've probably heard of these, I'm guessing, yeah. Um, so I was actually kind of wondering what you think about that, especially considering that when you talk about perspective taking, you, you mentioned you, I mean, verbal processes are obviously a very big part of perspective taking. So what do you think about that? And do you think that it's um, possible for a nonverbal animal or um, to non-verbally acquire theory of mind? Okay. Um, I think perspective taking in the way um, I would look at it from an RFT point of view in terms of these types of dialectic repertoires, they seem uh, so verbally rich um, and complex that it's unlikely that, um, I imagine it's unlikely that animals or primates would be able to engage in those repertoires. Um, but I did have a colleague in my office today telling me he had trained rats to theory of in theory of mind, <laughs> but as a separate issue. But um, so I imagine that it's a bit too um, verbally rich. I don't think it changes anything about uh, a relation of frame theory interpretation of um, dialectics or language if animals do train up in these repertoires. But it just seems unlikely that, given that it's um, something that children, language able children. Um, don't do one till four or five to a large or complex degree. Um, I, I find it unlikely. We're uh, near to the time we said we would uh, let you uh, off the hook, uh, uh, late as it, as it is where you are. Um, do you have uh, concluding comments or things that you might want to just share with us? Uh, and I, 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 one thing I would be particularly interested in would be, um, you know, you, you've been um, probably as much more than any, anybody out there really getting some momentum exactly on this issue of sort of carrying RFT up into more complex uh, kind of phenomena, including some that have some obvious applied relevance. If you were to kind of look ahead, uh, where do you see that going? What do you think the RFT folks ought to be uh, doing? Are there things in there that in your research program that it would be good to have multiple labs imitating? And if I could, could I add two other things? Looking up into the clinical community, are there things that the ACT community or the clinical community more generally, the applied community, ought to be doing looking back at RFT. And I, I'd be interested in, in ACT, but if you had comments also even about CBT or any of the other applied ones, <laughs> if you can keep it in your head just to add a last one. <laughs> How about behavior analysis? Because, you know, there's vast parts of behavior analysis where RFT is just, you know, it's just like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? And then you say, well, what have you read about? Ah, oh, I mean, it, it's just not even being considered, really and taken seriously in, uh, in a lot of the places where uh, behavior analytic skills are trained. So I'm asking you just to think broadly about where we are and looking ahead in these different aspects of, of uh, uh, that touch on it, of the, the RFT labs, the basic behavior analysis labs, the uh, applied labs uh, out there. Uh, what do you think? Where are we going? What should we be doing? If you're queen of the universe, what would you? Uh, <laughs> what would I do? What would you um, uh, be asking of people or suggesting to people? Um, I suppose in terms of what the RFT research need to do, and even in terms of um, thinking about what to include in the talk, I was thinking that there is um, a few key processes in the Axe Hexiflex that really do need to be fleshed out more clearly in relation to frame theory terms, in empirically. Um, even, you know, what I was suggesting in terms of acceptance as an alternative, not just analog studies to show that acceptance works, but really why and what process involved. I think that would be so critical to have those studies that got at all of those processes, even mindfulness or even contact with the present moment. If we could really model exactly what's occurring there functionally, I think that would um, really bolster uh, RFT as an account or an underpinning to ACT. Um, in terms of RFT researchers at the moment, I think they should tackle that. Um, I think pragmatically, one thing that's 
really important for RFT if we are going to um, come up with such a struggle in terms of behavior analysis and, and, and getting read by that audience. Um, I think they need to consider, really consider trying to get published in mainstream journals, big journals like JP, um, and uh, getting getting heard by a wider audience in that sense. And you know, you know, if, well, for me, or you know, RFT is not just a theory. I mean, it, it could be psychology to some degree. You know, RFT and ACT it really could make huge waves and changes. And and for that, it needs to be hitting and targeting um, mainstream topics speaking to cognitive paradigms but going that one step further in terms of changing behavior um i think is, is going to be an essential way in linking in with our cognitive colleagues collaborating with them on grants and research getting them to hear it that way i think so you know and i think i've i've um in, in some of the papers that i've done with some of the researchers they've been pure cognitivists and you know you, you you kind of run a paper that they think won't work and the next thing the data works and they're they're sold um you know that makes a big difference and i think even uh, you know reed is, is a colleague of mine who's very associationistic and you know i'm always trying to put him more towards derived stimulus relations um and we started doing stuff for with a lot of the other basic process work that he was doing in, in behavior analysis. We started putting in mindfulness interventions and it just started shifting schedule performance um, on lots of tasks that he'd been using with animals. And now he loves it. So that's a way in. And now he's much more favorable to dry stimulus relations and gradually he's been coming over that way. So I think um, RFT labs need to be really thinking in terms of a, a vision for the future that might be um, grounded in behavior analysis, but might have to target a wider audience um, and uh, you know it, it, it's very very difficult to get um, RFT research published in JM. You know I, I think I, I get easier review time from more mainstream journals now um, so. and what was the third? <laughs> Well, just to follow uh, follow on that one, um, if you kind of look ahead, do you see behavior analysis moving in this direction, or is are we really seeing the emergence of something that is going to split off and sort of be on it on its own? And because as you really start working with basic cognitive folks, you start uh, you know reaching out to uh, you know just like in the ACT folks where they to different uh, clinical traditions and so forth. Um, uh, do you have any sense uh, as to how this is going to play out over time and how we, how we should do it in a way, I'm not just asking a political question, I'm asking a scientific one, how we should do it in a way that maintains enough coherence that um, yeah. we can leverage what we've already learned. I mean, the, the behavior analytic vision was always that this is a cumulative science and that it's one of the few that really held on to the vision of a grand theory and all of that. Um, uh, it would be a shame to just let go of all that. On the other hand, you know, if we just stay inside the ghetto, um, uh, you know, nobody's uh, likely to be fighting their way into the ghetto to listen to our weird stuff. <laughs> um, any concluding comments? And then uh, I think we'll probably let that uh, be the end. But uh, uh, looking ahead to the future, anything else uh, that you want to add on that? I think a lot of the people the, who are going to look at these videos and stuff, these aren't necessarily people that you would know or just RFT people. These are people from behavior analysis, but also then people from uh, even outside the behavioral tradition. So. I think it's really important, um, well, for me as a researcher to stay in, uh, grounded in basic behavioral principles. But I, I, you know, I do want to make a, a larger impact on, on the psych psychology as a field. And I think that the way that we can do that is to, to have integrity to the science that we want to do and yet show behavior change. Because ultimately, I think that's the goal for everybody, even if they don't know it, who are coming into, who are psychologists, um, even the neuroscientists. I think ultimately, once they have um, seen what brain areas are responsible for whatever behaviors, they're going to come around again and realize, but actually, I, I actually wanted, you know, my end goal was to actually change how people behave and what they do. And I think the fact that RFT and ACT are powerful tools to do that, that, you know, softly, softly we'll get there and went over that, I think, I hope. <laughs> yes. well, 
thanks. These will let you uh, go, and uh, I think uh, this is just a, a lot of fun, and the work you're doing is just brilliant. I, I, I love uh, reading it, and I look forward to seeing where it goes. Thanks All for right. uh, being willing to play with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been wonderful. Bye. Right.